18th, my name, 2004. My name is Sarah Eberhard, and today I am interviewing Paul Warming, who was in the Army in World War II. If I could please have you state your name and date of birth, please. My name is Paul Arthur Warming. I was born on October 15, 1919, in Chicago, Illinois. Okay, and um, to get started, if you um, get you uh, to tell us a little bit about just right right before you went into the service, what you were um, doing, you were in school, and just talk a little bit about how that led into your into the service. In 1941, Congress passed the uh, draft law to draft all males in the United States between the ages of 21 and 27. At the time, I was a student at the University of Illinois. Subsequently, I dropped out of school, and therefore I was drafted under the wartime draft law, uh, which was designed to train people for only one year. However, December the 7th, 1941, changed the whole equation. So that one year turned out to be a four-year, less one-month uh, trip, which took me from Chicago to Missouri to California to New York to Liverpool, England, to Scotland, back to England, up to Perth and Cloyd, uh, Clyde in Scotland, down for the invasion of North Africa into Algeria, <coughs> across, <coughs> across, across into, across into uh, Tunis, Okay, we are continuing our interview here. Um, at the point where you um, um, on, had just joined up and were uh, talking about some of the places you had been um, in the early part of your journey. The, uh, a word on the 19th Engineer Combat combat regiment was activated on the 1st of June in 1940 for the regular army unit and uh, we uh, uh, went through seven campaigns uh, with the, uh, the 19th engineers. At various times we were uh, with of various divisions and units. We were attached at one time to the 1st Armored. We were attached to the 1st Infantry. We were attached to the 45th Division. We were attached to the 36th, the 34th, the 88th. All of these divisions that served in the areas where we were at one time or another had elements of the 19th Engineers attached to them because we as engineers were responsible for the movement of tanks and trucks with supplies, which meant that we had to clear the minefields. We had to build some of the primary roads so that these vehicles could uh, maneuver. And there were many occasions when we were out in front of the infantry and the tanks doing our job, which was to clear minefields. We wound up in uh, Tunisia, and uh, at that point we were converted into a infantry unit and placed in a position a place called Kasserine Pass, Tunisia, and our job was to hold off the German army long enough for the 1st Infantry Division 
the 1st Armored Division to get whatever units they had left back through the pass. And this was a, a tremendous baptism of fire for all of the units who were involved in this particular engagement. We were uh, overrun. Uh, our equipment was lousy. Our 37 millimeter anti-tank guns did nothing but bounce off the German tanks. There was no way we could stop them. After the end of the uh, campaigns in North Africa, we wound up in Sicily. We were part of General Patton's units in the Sicilian campaign. At the end of the Sicilian campaign, we went across the Straits of Messina into the southern part of Italy, and from there on in, we proceeded from the boot all the way up to the top. And in 1945, we wound up about 20 miles outside of Trieste, Yugoslavia, after the Germans had surrendered. We went through all of the campaigns in Italy, including Casino. At Casino, we were the engineers that were responsible for ferrying the 141st Infantry Regiment, part of the 36th Texas National Guard Division. We were responsible for ferrying them across the Lepidio River outside of Casino. And, uh, clearing the minefields so they could go across. They did and they were slaughtered. A whole battalion from the 141st was decimated. They uh, declared a truce through the Red Cross to allow our trucks to go over on the other side of the river and pick up the dead the next couple of days. Interestingly enough, you all heard about the horrible bombing of the Monte Cassino, the abbey that sat up on top of a hill. The Germans were accused of using it as an observation post. They claimed that they were not. Due to the insistence of a general from the Indian Division, which was part of the British contingents that were there, we convinced our people to bomb this abbey, which was built in the 10th century. Uh, it was done. We were down in the valley in front of the, the whole episode and watched it, and it was just a horrible thing to see this thing destroyed that had been so important in Christianity particularly back through the Dark Ages, when it was done. And then we discovered that the Germans apparently were not using it as an observation post. From there we proceeded up into Rome, through Rome, and then of course all the way up into the Po Valley and beyond. The living conditions in the Algerian, Tunisian, Sicilian, Italian campaigns were horrible. Most of the time we slept outside in holes. About how long um, were you on in that campaign or in that particular area? Um, I have a uh, little article here. Here's a uh, article written up by the Stars and Stripes, which uh, was uh, printed in Italy, January 17, 1945. That'll answer some of your questions. Uh, they discovered that our regiment had spent close to 550 days 
uh, at the front or in a position where we could be fired upon by artillery or whatever. And uh, Tell me a little bit more, you were starting to talk about the, the living conditions and how poor they were. Um, well, when you're living yeah. in, a, uh, in the field, so to speak, in the wintertime in the mountains of Italy, it's very, very cold. You get some snow from time to time. It's wet. It's completely miserable. And uh, this is the way we lived. And uh, uh, we, uh, from time to time, we would have uh, tents. But uh, that wasn't all the time because of the uh, situation. And uh, it was uh, very, very primitive. And uh, we didn't have a barracks and places to go to get out of the weather. Uh, a lot of the uh, buildings that we occupied in some cases, not in all, were ruins, and uh, but uh, we managed to survive. It's amazing what uh, the American soldier can do when he has to, and uh, but uh, the living conditions were not first rate. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Were, were, was there any type of a, a routine there, or was it? different from day to day? I mean, were you... Uh, oh, it would be different from day to day because you had different assignments. Uh, the Germans, uh, being on the defensive, would uh, blow all of the bridges, would destroy most of the roads when they could, and would plant a lot of minefields. So there was always something new coming up as we advanced up the uh, up into Italy, uh, either in repairing a road or building a a minor bridge across a small, you know, river or uh, ravine, and don't forget that most of these roads that we were on in parts of Italy were in the mountains, and there are two lane winding roads that were very difficult to maneuver, even at best, but had been blown up and so forth by the Germans. Mm -hmm. So we were busy all the time. And uh, our responsibility, as I mentioned before, was to make sure that the, the tanks could get where they wanted to be and that the, the vehicles carrying supplies could get where they wanted to be. Now, in many of the mountain areas, uh, the infantry was supplied by an Italian army group that used mules. And they walked up the side of these mountains with these mules that were loaded down with munitions and food and so forth. The food that we had was the basic sea rations we didn't have the extensive uh, diet that they have today. And uh, I never will forget one of the greatest things that ever happened when we, one time we wound up in Italy with a whole boatload of fresh eggs, which was a real, real treat. Um, now let's say after you've got your timeline there. Um, from there, that's when you proceed. Um, uh, where did you go on to from there? Where was the next place? Well, that you in, uh, in Italy, uh, after the Germans surrendered up into the, the Po Valley, up in the northern part of the country, five German divisions surrendered. Why then uh, the army had a program in effect which was a rotation program depending upon the number of points that you had 
accumulated during the time of your service. Length of time, uh, wounded in action, all of these things entered into the number of points. If you had a certain number of points, and I did, I was sent back to the States for discharge. This was before the war in the, in the Pacific was over with. Some of us that had been at it for uh, close to four years had enough points to be discharged. In 1945, I was discharged in July of 1945, and that's before the Japanese surrendered uh, in uh, the Pacific. Well, we were shipped back, and uh, it was interesting because uh, uh, we were uh, taken down to uh, Naples, I believe, and they put us on a converted B-17 bomber and flew us to French Morocco, and there we got on a civilian air transport plane and flew to the Azores where we were refueled and then across the ocean into Miami. And from Miami they took us up to Camp Landing in North Florida to wait a train ride up to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where we, had, we were inducted. And uh, at Fort Sheridan, we uh, uh, all wound up uh, being discharged before the end of the war in the Pacific. And it was interesting because when we got to Fort Sheridan for discharge, the first time we went down the chow line for our food, Guess who was serving the food? German prisoners of war. Um, tell, you had um, uh, shown me this picture earlier of some of the German prisoners of war, and um, I'd like you to tell that again about how the, some of the captured uh, German prisoners of war would end up over here in their reactions to that. At the uh, fall of Tunis, when the German army surrendered, those that remained, uh, the Allies wound up with over 100,000 prisoners, both German and, uh, and Italian. And I had the, uh, the experience of running into a, a German hospital shortly after the surrender, where uh, I interviewed, you might say, a group of German prisoners who, after these particular prisoners, were delighted to be captured by the Americans because they knew by reputation we were not like the Russians. The Russians would kill them, uh, or the Poles would kill them, and uh, these people knew that they would be well taken care of and they were shipped back to the States. And many of them, uh, the stories that I have heard that wound up around the Chicago area, they had a terrible time keeping them from running away, not because they wanted to go back to Germany, but they wanted to stay here in our country. And some of these PWs actually did by marrying girls that they met while they were PWs. And they wound up in this country. Uh, that, that leads me into another interesting story. People don't remember or know that the units that finally took Casino after a long time and a lot of people getting killed were a Polish division. Now, where did this Polish division come from? These people were former prisoners of war of the Russians. England convinced Russia to turn these prisoners over to them, and they assembled them all that could make them. A lot of them died because the Russians took care of them terribly. They had them in Iraq and equipped them, trained them, and they became a Polish infantry division, 
which was the division that finally took Casino. So today, behind the, behind the rebuilt abbey, there's a cemetery containing a lot of Polish boys that were killed in that particular battle. They hated the Germans because of what the Germans had done to their country. They hated the Russians because of what the Russians had done to them. And uh, it was a sad story, but it was a story that, that a lot of people don't know about, that it was a Polish division that actually took Casino. In Italy, we had a composite group of, of uh, army. We had a Jewish brigade. We had a brigade from Brazil. We had the French Foreign Legion. We had a British division, which had an Indian division, or British Army, which had an Indian division. Those were, uh, they, they also had a battalion of Gurkhas. The Gurkhas are the little guys with the round knives that would go out at night and cut off heads. We had a South African division a British division, American divisions, and the Polish division. It was a composite of many, many different countries, all in that particular campaign. How, how, how was that in terms of everybody getting along? Was there any tension between any particular groups or no, no, everybody no, the same you're, cause? You're all, you're all basically okay. trying to do the same thing and that's survived. Now, initially there was a lot of loudmouth Americans that, uh, that did a lot of talking about the conditions of the British Army and so forth. Their equipment wasn't as good as ours, and, uh, but uh, I think that was overblown. There were some Americans in Britain that, that did a lot of, there's always a, some loud talkers, uh, you know, and uh, uh, that, that incurred a little bit of uh, unhappiness, but basically, no, now the, the only difference was one time uh, we had the French Foreign Legion on our right flank, and uh, some Italians came running into our CP command post, uh, screaming and hollering that the Americans had to do something because the Foreign Legion was raping and killing people. And uh, nobody made a move because that's the way the Foreign Legion operated. When they took over a town, that was it. They took over the town. And uh, you weren't going to go out there and tell them to stop because if you did, they'd, they'd kill you. You're in a war. This is not a basketball game. Things happen. Civilians are killed. Civilians are starving to death. Civilians are raped. Uh, when the British bombed Dresden in Germany, you know how, to, how many people were, how many civilians were killed? Over a hundred thousand. And we worry about a few Arabs who've been killing our people. I don't understand that. This is warfare. This is warfare, and uh, you talk to some of the survivors in Poland and find out what they went through, or in some of these other countries, and uh, it's not a pretty picture. But this compassion we seem to have for uh, the PWs that we pick up, who are committed to killing us, I don't understand that attitude if we get a little rough with them. Do we want the information they have or don't we? Um, now, something else you had told earlier that uh, that you had witnessed was the, um, the destruction of the cathedral. I was wondering if you could go back and, and recount that for us as well because that was a uh, a very unique experience that you were there when it actually happened. Yes, the, uh, this has to do with the Battle of Casino. Casino was a very, very important position because it was just south of Rome and it opened up the roads leading into Rome 
and through Rome, and the Germans had prepared a very, very stiff defense. They had built all kinds of uh, defensive uh, uh, caves, uh, forts, uh, uh, everything that you can imagine in the mountains to defend this area. And uh, the casino itself fronted on a valley. The valley ran for about 12 miles. And up on top of the one mountain above Casino, this the little town of Casino, which was a small town, sat the abbey that had been built in the 10th century, 11th century. It was an abbey uh, uh, for a certain uh, type of monk. It contained scriptures, it contained Greek writing, uh, it contained all kinds of things, plus art, uh, paintings, statues, and so forth. And uh, the Germans were accused, of course, of using it as an observation post for their artillery, because their artillery was very, very uh, accurate. You could barely move in this valley without incurring some artillery particularly on the road junctions where you had to, tra you had to travel uh, in order to get from A to B. So successive divisions tried to capture Casino with very heavy casualties because the German unit that was at Casino was the first SS paratroop division these were all fanatical, die-hard Nazis, tremendous soldiers. So finally, when they assigned the British to take a crack at the casino, other than the Americans, a commander, as I understand it, from the British Indian Division, insisted that the United States bomb the casino to deny it to the Germans for observation. Now, nobody had ever proved that that was taking place. It was all hearsay. <clears throat> but we did it. And I stood in the valley along with the rest of our guys, and we watched the bombing, and it was sad. Now, whether this Indian general was a Muslim or not, I don't know. But now we seem to be so sensitive, we can't go into Iraq, into this mosque, where this guy's holed up and grab him. We bombed the casino, and it's still, the Indian division still couldn't take the town. So they finally had to bring in the Polish division, which got the job done. And then, of course, it opened up the road to Rome. Rome being an open city, there was no fighting or bombing in Rome. And we looked forward to getting to Rome. And when we got there, we went right through town and wound up 20 miles north of Rome. About 100 miles north of Rome, I was in a minefield with some of my people, and we stepped on a person home mine, and it killed someone and wounded me. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your, I, I noticed you... Yes, I wound up uh, in a general hospital in Rome, and I was there for close to two months. But being the situation that was in Italy, shortage of manpower because they were taking a lot of units to make up the D-Day invasion and also the invasion of southern France. We were short of people, so you never got rotated home. And uh, I went back to my unit eventually. 
but that's how I acquired uh, my Purple Heart. And uh, uh, this was one of the jobs we had to do because it was our responsibility as engineers. Um, but uh, I was lucky in the sense that uh, I didn't lose a limb. It wasn't worse, you know. Was there were there high casualties in your unit? Um, Our unit wasn't too bad. Uh, we lost some people. We didn't. There was never high casualties of uh, uh, like the infantry, unless you consider what happened to us at Casino. Not Casino. I'm sorry. At Casserine Pass in Tunisia. At Kasserine Pass in Tunisia, we were put in the line as infantry, and I went in there with about 50 people in my platoon and came out of there with about 23, 24. The rest of them had been captured, killed, or whatever. I never did find out what happened to them, but we took a terrible, terrible slacking there. But that never happened to us again. But some of the infantry had a terrible, terrible high rate of casualties, depending upon what they were involved in. Another unit that I failed to mention that's very, very important in the Italian campaign was the 442nd Regimental Combat Team made up of Japanese Americans who were all volunteers. They wound up as the most decorated unit in the United States Army. Their attitude was, we're going to show these people in the United States that we are dyed-in-the-wool Americans. They were all little fellows. And uh, they started out with a battalion of volunteers, and that grew to a regimental combat team. I was in the hospital in Rome with a guy who was the first sergeant in that unit, Mike Aguera, and uh, Mike had been shot in the stomach and survived. And we both got out of the hospital at the same time and were sent to a reconditioning camp where uh, we spent some time doing things we weren't supposed to do. Okay. I ran into Mike after the war. We were both going to the University of Chicago, night school in downtown Chicago. He survived. They had very high casualties. They were all volunteers, Japanese boys. You don't hear much about those. Uh, but uh, they finally went into southern France with the invasion there and uh, had some interesting experiences. Um, what, what overall from, I mean, you had so many, so many unique experiences over there. Is there anything in particular that stands out or is it just something you took from the whole experience? Or, or I would say uh, the thing that I took from the experience, based on what I saw, the living conditions, uh, the way people lived in other parts of the world, the way other people lived in uh, uh, compared with the way we live in this country, it gave me a deep appreciation. It caused me to thank my lucky stars that my people came from Europe and settled in the United States. There is no country in the world that has given its population what this country has given, and there is no culture in the world's history 
that has given mankind as much as our civilization has done. That right there, the automobile, the steamship, the elevator, the x-ray machine, penicillin, all of the things that you find in the doctor's office, all of the things that we take for granted, were all invented by people in our culture. In our culture. Not in Asia, not in the Near East, not in Africa, but here. The next time you go to the doctor's office and you get a, a very extensive test, ask the operator who invented that machine. They don't know. They don't know. That gave me a tremendous appreciation for our country. And it pains me to hear these people complain. Because another thing we did, we had a large enough army that we could have taken over the whole of Europe at the end of World War II. What did we do? We pulled out, and instead of taking over these countries, we gave money to rebuild. We give them expertise to rebuild. There's never been a country in the history of the world that has done this. Did the same thing with the Japanese. And it wasn't easy. And it wasn't, didn't happen overnight. It took years. But look what's, what Germany is today. Look what Japan is today. It also gave me an appreciation of uh, the fact that you have to be on the alert constantly because you'll always find people that hate the rich guy. You'll always find people in the world that are envious of us. We drive beautiful cars. We eat well. We go to Publix. Get all of this stuff we take for granted. You don't find that in the other parts of the world. <clears throat> that gave me tremendous appreciation for that. Unfortunately, we have people that are in uh, influential positions who have the opposite view. We're bad. We're terrible. We're awful. It's not true. It's not true. And as you were mentioning a little bit, bit earlier, uh, you know, some of your reflections on the current situation that we're in in Iraq and how things have evolved in the various conflicts since World War II up to where we are now, and and uh, and what's your what's your you know your uh, opinion and and some of the the thoughts that that you've had in in the way things have have changed since since the time you were in. Well, when you have a group of people who make no bones about the fact that they want to kill you, you had better take action. Now, if you want to fight them in the streets of Atlanta, or you want to fight them in Iraq, you better make a decision. Because it has to be done. It has to be done. And, uh, 9-11 proved what they can do if they want to and if they're left alone. And uh, I'm just appalled that we're so sensitive about what other people think that we make ourselves vulnerable. We shouldn't care about what other people think. With the amount of money that we spend around the world, with the amount of food that we supply the world, it comes from the Midwest, the corn, all the rest of the stuff. We shouldn't worry about what the other people think because they're always going to hate you if you have more than them. So 
we ought to do the job and do the job right and get it dealt with. And if we don't, I'm afraid somewhere along the line uh, we might lose it. Um, Not from the enemy from outside, but from the enemy inside. Most revolutions that took place in our, the history of our planet were organized by small groups of people. Not the majority of people. Therefore, what good are the are the uh, uh, are the polls that they keep quoting in the press? They don't mean a thing. Doesn't make any difference what you think or what I think. There's a small group of people that could influence what happens, and that scares me. I'm going to rewind a bit again and get you to also recap. Um, this is a little bit out of uh, chronological order here, but when you came back and were discharged, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what did you, um, did you, you mentioned you went back to school or where did you pick up um, from there and what influence did, did your service have on, what, on your decisions that you made as you got back well, into the Well, uh, the most uh, gratifying uh, thing uh, was uh, the uh, bill that was passed by Congress to help subsidize uh, the education of uh, World War II veterans. When I came back, I was uh, uh, discharged in July of uh, 45, and uh, I received a I think it was a $300 bonus for the state of Illinois to um, for my wartime service. And after I spent that one, I decided I better go to work. So I went down to uh, the Loop in Chicago and I walked into the division offices of the Standard Oil of Indiana. 20 North Wacker, where the Civic Opera Building is on the river, and I arrived at Skyscraper. Went up to the 10th floor and walked in, and I said, uh, are you looking for salesmen? They said, what do you have in mind? We sat down, and I went to work for the Standard Oil of Indiana for $225 a month, which was a pretty good job in those days. Uh, trying to sell fuel oil in the western suburban area. And uh, that was the start of my work history. And then, of course, I went to night school. At the same time, I went to the University of Chicago night school, and I also went to Northwestern to take a couple of courses. But, uh, uh, this is after your work all day, and initially with Standard Oil, I didn't have a car. So uh, I had to take the Illinois Central, as you're, you're familiar with, down to the loop, walk uh, over to the L, and take the L out to Old Park. And then I have to, had to get off the L and walk in the neighborhoods all day long looking for fill pipes. If I spotted a fill pipe, that meant they were using fuel oil for heat. I'd knock on the door and try to sell them standard oil fuel oil. And after about a year of that, it took me about three hours to go out there and come back home at night. After about a year of that, they gave me a car, company car. And I was well on my way to a pretty decent job, but uh, that was the start. But there were uh, a lot of guys that uh, wound up doing the same thing. We never complained because we, we didn't have this or we didn't have that. You went out and did it. 
and uh, nobody uh, handed me the job. I got it myself, and I, I kept it myself because I, I worked, and uh, that's a little bit different than some people even today, and I'm sorry to get into the political ramifications. No, but. because this is this is your time to talk about it. Now, you, since you were already back, something else I wanted to ask you were, um, did you take part in any of the celebrations after the uh, Japanese surrender, or were, no? No. No. Um, one of the things that, uh, it's impressive uh, on people like myself. They shipped me home at one time from Italy for a 30-day furlough. It was called a uh, uh, rehabilitation based on the wounds, you know, received in the minefield. And when I got back to the States, this was still during the, the war on both fronts, why I was amazed at the number of people that were still there, men, you know, and women and so forth, and uh, all doing very well because all of the defense plans were hiring a lot of people and uh, uh, wages were going up and things were better financially. They weren't hurting a bit. Oh, they had a few problems getting cigarettes or getting gasoline, but basically nothing, in comparison to what the people in Italy were going through. And uh, that was kind of a shocker. They really didn't understand what was going on, any more than they do today. Any more than they do today. But. Um, now, you, you brought some um, some items here that I'd like to um, get you to hold up on on camera here and just tell me a little bit about them, like um, some of the... Um, well, here's an interesting letter that was sent to the soldiers of the 7th Army. The 7th Army was the American Army that was in Sicily. We were part of that. This is a letter from General Patton to soldiers of the 7th Army. It was written on the 23rd of August, 1943, General Order No. 18. Born at sea, baptized in blood, I'm quoting, and crowned with victory in the course of 38 days of inconsistent battle and unceasing labor, you have added a glorious chapter to the history of war fitted against the best the Germans and Italians should offer. You have been unfailingly successful. The rapidity of your dash, which culminated in the capture of Palermo, was equaled by the dogged tenacity, tenacity with which you stormed Troina and captured Messina. Every man in the army deserves equal credit. Uh, the engineers perform progenies in the construction and maintenance of impossible roads over impassable country. And then he goes on, uh, as a result of this combined effort, you have killed or captured 113,350 enemy troops. You have destroyed 265 of his tanks, 2,324 vehicles and 1,162 large guns, and in addition, have collected a mass of military booty run into, running into hundreds of tons. The President of the United States, the Secretary of War, the Chief of Staff, General Eisenhower, General Alexander, General Montgomery, have all congratulated you. Your fame will never die. Reproduced at Second Corps headquarters, 25th of August, 1943.
here's another one <clears throat> from General Bradley, Lieutenant General, commanding the Second Corps that we were attached to. Commendation of the 19th Engineer Regiment to the commanding officer, 19th Engineer Regiment. I wish to commend the 19th Engineer Regiment for the part it played in bringing the Sicilian campaign to a successful conclusion on the 17th of August. The Germans used all means at their disposal for impeding our progress and their demolition of bridges and sowing of minefields would have slowed our advance much more had it not been for the untiring efforts of the 19th Engineer Regiment. By your service to duty and your energetic efforts, you contributed greatly to the success of the campaign. Every member of the regiment should feel proud of the part he has played in this latest step towards the successful conclusion of the war. C.M. Bradley, Lieutenant General, USA, commanding. And then our colonel will put a little deal down here. Sicily is where I lost my lieutenant. We were sleeping together and I sleeping together, I don't want to the way it sounds, in a little pup tent in an olive grove. Our platoon was in there. And one night we were sharing this little pup tent. You know, each one of us carried a shelter half you put together and you make a little pup tent. And the next day he went out and got killed. That's where he was killed, was in Sicily. But I oh, thought these were... Uh, that is a... That was a wonderful. Now, what about some of the other stuff you've got in uh, in your well, book there? Uh, you must remember that any buddy you interview, it's important to have some sort of proof of what they're talking about. This is a actual history of the unit that I was in. This is an Army history. Um, We'll make some copies of those, definitely. Uh, this is uh, on the. This is my discharge, uh, and on yeah. the back side. On the back side is the uh, the meat and potatoes. Tunisian, Algeria, French, Moroccan, Sicilian, Naples, Foggia, Rome, Arno, Po Valley, North Apennine. Yeah, these are these are all campaigns. Seven. Purple Heart. Good Conduct Ribbon. American Defense Service Ribbon. European, African. Uh, Middle Eastern theater with ribbon with one silver and two bronze stars, five overseas service bars. Uh, this is proof of what I've been talking about. That's wonderful. And uh, That's wonderful the way you have it preserved as well. And, uh, here's an article that were wound up in the, in the Fort Myers news press about our experience at Gasoline Pass. Uh, we, were, we were decimated mm -hmm. because of poor equipment. When the gunner of your 37 millimeter gun, which is supposed to be your anti-tank gun, fires five rounds and they bounce off the tanks that he's shooting at, and he turns around and he says, what, I'm, what am I supposed to do? What do you tell him? See your congressman? Mm -hmm. uh, so. And then you had these. Um, yeah, that was my rag. Mm -hmm. uh, this is money. Uh, Moroccan, Algerian money. We printed our own money in Italy. 
the army did because their money wasn't worth anything. There was no government. So this is all Moroccan, Tunisian, um, here's a small copy of that same thing I gave you. Here are some pictures of uh, some of the destruction. This is a picture of my father, commissioned a second lieutenant in the infantry in World War I. So we've got, and he was only a, a first generation born of immigrant parents. His parents came, my grandparents came from Sweden, and uh, they uh, were uh, here in this country in uh, 1882, and uh, he uh, put himself through law school and wound up with a commission in the Army with no help from anybody an immigrant son, and uh, this is the, uh, the service, this is the draft uh, deal where I was drafted, mm -hmm. and this is some, some uh, material of a written uh, transportation changes, you know, Another history of the regiment. Um, Department of the Army sent me a letter. There's a letter from a general to my parents. I am pleased to inform you that the latest report from the Theater of Operation states that on 31 of July, your son, Staff Sergeant Paul A. Warmy was making normal improvement. You have my assurance that when additional information is received concerning his condition, you will be notified immediately. That's a general in Washington. Um, this is uh, a thing that was put out by our colonel after the debacle at Gasoline Pass. Okay. Um, these are, I would, I get a kick out of this. This is a telegram that was sent to my folks. My mother was dead, but my father and my, my aunt lived in Chicago. Regret to inform you, your son, Staff Sergeant Paul A. Warmy, was on 7th July, slightly wounded, in action in Italy, period, you will be advised as reports of condition are received. Julio, the agent, uh, agent general, that's out of Washington, and he said to slightly wounded, but it took me two months to get out of the hospital, so draw your own conclusions. Um, this is duplication stuff. Okay. Um, a letter from one of the senators. I'm very sorry to learn that your war department, that the war department has informed you that your son, Staff Sergeant Paul A. Warmy, has been wounded while serving his country. This is uh, shipping orders and uh, some other stuff. That's about it. Well, we'll like to uh, make some copies of that. That's that's incredible documentation. It's so well organized too. Thank you. So, um, um, that your explanations, what you just told us about it, will all be documented together with the copies, and so that'll uh, right. be a, be a big help with that. Uh, any anything else you want to add? I mean, this is uh, this is your show here, and uh, we're getting towards the end of the tape. So I'm just going to see if there's anything else you well, want. Will I have to... a copy of that tape? Yes, you will. Thank you. Okay, is that it then? That's it. Okay. Thank.